just turn on my PowerPoint and then we'll proceed. Alrighty. So let me just do this. Let me share screen. Um, you guys can see this? Or Chicago, like, I definitely think you should be, they be way more. Uh, can you guys see this, Rachel? Yes, can... we can. Thank you. Okay, so, yeah, today's talk is on human papillomavirus and cancer. Uh, so when we talked about this earlier, uh, you know, I was, I'm from Orange County. Uh, I have three sisters. My older sister is a physical therapist. My two younger sisters are uh, nurses. Uh, and they work in the operating room and the other one um, works with that orthopedic clinic. Uh, my father's a dentist, so our whole family is in healthcare. And this is the City of Hope Glendale uh, facility where I'm at. Um, you know, City of Hope branched out recently there's about 20 community clinics out here so we're in Glendale. the thought was that because you know our services are needed in the community you know the level of excellence we can provide you know, we want to make sure that this service also out in the community so what is cancer okay on the left we have normal cells and on the right we have cancer cells so normally a cell is directly to the most left right here this dark blue is the nucleus, and this outer circle is the complete cell. So usually they're small, they're, they're uniformly shaped, and there's a lot of this, what we call cytoplasm, which is this fluid that's outside of the nucleus. So usually the cells, they have very good structure. You see there's a very orderly alignment here. And, um, you know, they possess differentiated cell structures, meaning every single cell in our body actually consists of the same DNA. Uh, but what, what, what if it turned into a skin cell or a lung cell really depends on what's expressed. Um, so that usually comes from DNA that is formed into RNA. That RNA becomes proteins. Um, and down here you can notice that when normal cells divide, it's very orderly and the cells are clearly demarcated. Whereas on the right, these are cancer cells. Um, I mean, do you guys ever remember um, going to the dentist's office and they had the Highlights magazine and there was Goofus and Gallant? So, so Gallant is the normal cell. Goofus is the cancer cell on the right. So it's almost the opposite. These are large, variable-shaped nuclei. See how this nucleus is very large? The, 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 the organization is very, very you know, haphazard, um, very disorganized. Um, and there's loss of normal specialized features. And the way a breast cancer cell forms is, say, a ductal cell, ductal cells in the breast, when it becomes cancer, it no longer looks like a ductal cell. The DNA is kind of mutated, and it's lost that specialization. So basically, a cancer cell is a normal human cell that's kind of gone rogue, and it can keep dividing, 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 unchecked. Actually, at any time right now, there are cancer cells forming in our body. Usually our immune system is able to keep it in check. So it's a fine balance. Right? So normally our for healthy individuals, our immune system is always keeping these cancer cells in check. In some patients who are on immunosuppressant medications, steroids, or medications for rheumatoid arthritis, those lower your immune system, right? So these patients end up having weird types of cancers, exotic cancers that can form. So it's all kind of a fine balance of the body. Other causes of cancer, toxins, smoking cigarettes, uh, breathing in, you know, fumes, different dyes, those are things that can cause cancer. Diet, things we eat. Uh, colon cancer has been shown to be very high in patients, you know, who don't eat enough fiber. Uh, some of genetics, you know, genetics is, a bit, uh, it can cause cancer, but most cancers, only about 10% of them are really genetic. So when patients say, oh, you know, I can't believe I developed this cancer, I have no family history. Well, you know, most patients, they don't have a family history. Um, also hormonal causes. A lot of cancers grow off hormones. So breast cancer, estrogen may cause breast cancers to grow. Testosterone, prostate cancer actually consumes testosterone. So I had patients who 
take a test for injections, get buff, and they can get very aggressive prostate cancers at a young age it's because of this hormonal stimulation. Right? When you start stimulating cells to reproduce, re, uh, you know, uh, grow, grow, divide, 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 you can get DNA errors in it and they get propagated. Think about like a copy machine. You, you take a piece of paper, you copy it, right? Now you take that piece of paper, copy it again, do that 10 times. By the 10th time, that copy is all jagged and squeaky, whatever. So you really can kind of see that's how cancer, you know, can evolve and get worse and worse with each replication. Things like inflammation can also cause cancer. Certain skin cancers, irritation. I had one patient who wore sandals that didn't fit correctly, and they're getting a skin cancer on the foot. I have patients who have had dentures that don't fit properly. They irritate the gum and they can get cancers in the gum just from that inflammation. Because in inflammation can cause cancer. Um, usually it's long-term, 10 years, 20 years of irritation. Lastly, viruses. Okay, we'll talk about that too. Lots of viruses are known to cause cancer. So this is a list of different viruses, bacteria, parasites that can cause cancer. This first one up here, Epstein-Barr virus, can cause the nasopharyngeal cancer. Very common in Asians. So EBV virus is much more prevalent in you know, Asian countries. So you know, most of the patients are Asians who live in Asia. Asians who are born in the U.S., you know, they don't quite get the nasopharyngeal cancer. Next, hepatitis B virus, these can cause liver cancer. HIV can cause cancers too, because like I mentioned earlier, when you lower the immune system, um, you know, different cancers can form because of that. And the main one we're talking about tonight is human papilloma virus. Um, you know, there's some other ones here, uh, there's some bacteria parasites too. So what exactly is a virus? It, it's kind of interesting, most people don't exactly know what a virus is. They confuse it with a bacteria. Um, they like to use generic terms like germ. What exactly is a virus? You know, it's a submicroscopic infectious agent. And it actually can only replicate inside the living cell of an organism. Basically, a virus takes over a cell, injects its DNA into the cell, and uses the cell's machinery to start making its own proteins and replicating its own DNA, making more and more viruses. And finally, it kind of explodes and releases more virus that affects other cells. So it's quite scary what a virus can do. Uh, you know, and even bacteria, bacteria can be affected by viruses. These are called bacteriophages. So a bacteria is an actual living organism. Vi viruses aren't very really considered living organisms. And most bacteria, they're 100 times bigger than virus. So look at this chart. We're comparing bacteria with viruses. So bacteria on the left, viruses on the right. The bacteria is living. It's unicellular. It's one cell. It can be killed off with antibiotics. Usually, an infection is localized to one area of the body. But, you know, it can't spread. You people need sepsis. Um, and, you know, some bacteria are beneficial. You know, in our intestines, there's actually a lot of healthy bacteria that help humans. Uh, when bacteria grow, they reproduce, one cell turns into two. The size is usually large. Whereas on the right, viruses, they're basically non living. Um, you know, they're usually a systemic, they infect the whole body. Um, there's no known beneficial viruses at this point. And the way it grows, it invades the host cell and basically takes over the cell. And viruses are super tiny. So this is a viral virus structure. So basically, it consists of the DNA or RNA. So viruses, there's different classes based on if it's DNA or RNA. And whether if it's single strand or double strand. Uh, and then it's wrapped with this capsid layer. It's like a kind of shell that protects the DNA. And some viruses have this envelope. It's like this big ball that covers it, you know, kind of protecting it and helping it to grab onto things so it can fuse in. So to the left, this is a naked virus. There's no envelope. And to the left, this is an envelope virus. It's an envelope. 
So this is another picture. You see the actual virus is this purple uh, structure right here. That's the capstan and the, the, the DNA, the genome is in the middle and the envelope is this outside structure right here. Um, so it, we often look in the news and we see this structure, right? And they say coronavirus. So this is an envelope that you guys are seeing. The red are little glycoproteins that help with the patch. Um, the actual virus caps and everything. So there's, you know, different types of virus structures. Um, you know, some look like the cylinder, some look like um, this kind of uh, you know, um, structure. Uh, this third one, this is the influenza virus, and this right one right here uh, is a fake bacterial phage. This is kind of the most common structure right here. So as I mentioned earlier, the central dogma is that DNA is transcribed into RNA, and that's translated or made into proteins. Okay. So different viruses have different genomes. Um, and that's how we group them. So we look here, herpes. Herpes, most to the left. DS means double strand. DNA means DNA. So these are double strand DNA viruses. Your genome has double stranded DNA. Uh, to the right is single stranded DNA. So these are toggle virus. Um, and this is double stranded RNA viruses, single stranded RNA. And the RNA viruses are grouped if they're red positive sense or negative sense. Uh, basically, they're red backwards or forwards. So, just a point of interest, coronavirus right here, coronaviridae, it's a single strand RNA. Okay. Um, herpes virus, single stranded RNA. Human, uh, well, human, actually, herpes is a double stranded virus. Um, and let's see. so we look at a flu virus, right? It's a flu virus, is actually orthomixone virus. So it's a single stranded RNA virus, and it's red negative sense. Good job. Um, okay. So human papillomavirus uh, means a sexually transmitted HPV infection and very common and actually most are asymptomatic. Um, and untreated cases of women are the main cause of cervical cancer. So look at this diagram here, you know, you kind of see the virus enters the cervix through micro ablations, you know, breaks in the cervix and they can infect the cells. Several weeks later, the infection spreads. Like the virus kind of takes over cells, takes over their host machinery, starts to make its own proteins and can spread. 90% of cases is healed within two years. So 10 to 30 years later, about 28% of cases can develop into cancer. So it tells you that you know, even though 90% of the cases heal, most of them, most patients, you know, some patients may still carry, um, you know, the virus and can develop cancer. And it's, it's, it's a balance between the immune system and cancer. You actually see some patients as they get older, um, you know, the chance of developing these uh, cancers go a little bit higher. So cancer cells, they go from normal to a hyperplasia, a little bit of overgrowth. Displaced to me and look, kind of look kind of weird, and now they become cancer cells. Um, this is some kind of a similar representation of what I discussed before, going from normal epithelium to basically cancer. Um, and there's like some latency with cervix for cervical cancer. The average infection age is 29. Development of cancer is usually 49, about 20 years later. Uh, you know, oral pharyngeal cancer. Average age of infection around 30, and development of cancer usually 50, it's about 20 years later. Um, so it tells us our body is probably able to clear the infection initially, but at some point, when these dormant viruses, they wake up. So with human papilloma virus, there's many, many different subtypes. There's not just one. You know, if you look at this, you know, 16, 18, 38, 68, and there's even some low risk ones. The ones we worry about most that cause cancer are the top ones, 16, 18, 31, and 35. Um, the main two proteins that cause cancer is, are the E6 and E7 proteins. These proteins 
have effects on cells. So usually what they do is they promote cell growth. They, they don't really allow um, cells to die off. So by these proteins kind of being made by our normal cells, right? they cause our normal cells to kind of mutate and keep dividing and dividing. So the biologic consequences is more DNA synthesis is made for the cancer. Cell death is decreased. Um, and there's some genomic instability and angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is basically the making of more blood vessels. So what happens is tumors, they're rogue. They want to steal resources and nutrition from our normal cells. So they end up building more blood vessels uh, so they can get more food, more nutrition from the rest of the body. So this is looking at HPV cancer in the U.S. Every year in the U.S., there are about 11,000 cases of cervical cancer, 14,000 cases of oral pharyngeal cancer. And on, on the lesser side, you know, about 6,500 cases of anal cancer, 3,500 cases of vulvar and vaginal cancers, and 900 cases of penile cancers. So it really cause a whole host of diseases. It's estimated that at least 75 to 80 percent of all adults have been exposed. Most of us, you know, we're asymptomatic. And most carriers, we, we have no idea we're carriers. And there's no real good diagnostic test for these pre infections. You know, so, um, you know, when they analyze, you know, cells in the cervix, sometimes they run, you know, DNA uh, markers for HPV, you know, 16 to 18 and all that. But there's no real good general screening test for the population. So what it's caused is oral pharyngeal cancer. So, so what is the oral pharynx? So the oral cavity is right here in the front. The mouth, the tongue, oral tongue. The oral pharynx is the part that's in the back, you know, so that consists of, you know, our tonsils in the back, our base of the tongue. Um, so here is the green tonsils and base. These areas are rich in lymphatic tissue. So that may be a reason why these are more involved is that lymphatic tissue, you know, there may be a, a predisposition for any virus to affect these areas. How common is it? Unfortunately, you know, it is pretty rare, but we're seeing more and more cases of it. So if you look at this, um, in 2019, new cases of breast cancer, about 268,000 cases. Plus oral cavity and pharyngeal cancer, about 53,000. Um, here we have prostate cancer, 174,000. Lung cancer, 228,000. Right In terms of deaths, we see here, you know, cancer very deadly, 142,000 uh, deaths a year. Um, so very deadly. Looking at oral cavity and pharyngeal cancer, about 10,000. So this cancer affects males more. You know, in 2019, about 14,000 cases were males, female about 3,000. So about four to one male predominance. There's some studies that show that perhaps tonsillectomies, that the tonsil is removed, it may prevent oral pharyngeal cancer. But this is a study done at Johns Hopkins where they're looking at different risk factors uh, for oral pharyngeal cancer. We found that high number of oral sex partners, greater than six, predicted for increased chance of oral pharyngeal cancer. And also high lifetime vaginal partners, than 26 partners, predicted for higher chance. So the, the most common you know, uh, demographic to get this cancer is actually a white male, Caucasian male. So among Caucasians, you know, in 100,000 people, 1.8 women were diagnosed with HPV associated oral pharyngeal cancer versus 9.4 men. Uh, among Black Americans, about 1.4 women versus 6.6 men, 100,000 were diagnosed with HPV associated oral pharyngeal cancer. Uh, much lower in Asian and Pacific Islander, 0 0.6 women per 100,000, and 2.2 men per 100,000. Among Hispanic people, about 0 0.9 women in 100,000, and 4.4. So we definitely see, you know, it's it kind of there's a, there's a 
a bias towards Caucasian uh, men. So we look at rates of smoking and head and neck cancer. Traditionally, most head and neck cancers you know, were from smoking. Um, so we look at this, there's actually been a huge decline of smoking in the US. So if you look at the left, uh, the green line is men, the red line is women. We see from 1910 and 1950, there's an increase in smoking. Uh, but kind of in the 60s and 70s after that, smoke started going down and going down and going down and going down. When we look at this graph on the right, we see that head and neck cancers you know, have gone up with smoking. Back in the 1970s, smoking went down, but oral pharyngeal cancer kept going up. Even other head and neck cancers went down. Right, but some reason all pharyngeal cancer kept going up. Um, and it's due to this kind of bias for the HPV to affect the oral pharyngeal structures more than other areas. Although we see oral cavity lesions, even the laryngeal larynx lesions with HPV infection sometimes too. So now there's actually vaccination for um, you know, HPV uh, infections. Um, originally, you know, um, it was for much older patients, it was recommended to get it, but now they're actually recommending routine vaccination for ages starting as early as 11 or 12. It can say at age nine. Um, they also recommend everyone through age 26, if not adequately vaccinated previously, use these vaccines. This is from the CDC website. And the HB vaccination is usually given as a series of two or three doses, depending on your age. Now, there's kind of a, a gray area. They say some adults 27 to 35 may decide to get the HPV based on discussions. Um, you know, but they say HPV vaccination in this age range may provide less benefit for several reasons, including that more people in this age range probably have already been exposed to HPV. Which is kind of interesting because there's lots of data too that suggest cancers like anal cancer, when they spread out and become aggressive, that patients who actually had the vaccine before, they actually actually do not have as aggressive as a course of cancer. So, you know, I still think there may be still some protective effect, even if you know, they're not in that young, less than 27 year old age. So the HPV vaccines, they vaccinate against several subtypes. And, you know, the original ones were against just a few. You know, four, you know, those are 86, 11, 16, and 18. Um, but now there's ones that can actually cover nine HPV subtypes 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 32, 58. If you look at this cervical cancer, the four HPV subtypes, there's about 70% coverage, but the nine HPV vaccine subtypes, 90%. So there's increased coverage here. Same with vulva cancer, vaginal cancer, adrenal cancer. Right. So you know, this is you know our, the typical scenario we see in the clinic. You know, these two light male presents with a painless neck mass, painless swallowing and weight loss, and also some coughing up of blood. Okay. Uh, so I, just, I, I want to see if I could pull the audience. You know, what, what do you guys think we should do in this case? Am I able to see uh, chats? Let's see. Chat responses. Am I able to see chat responses? I don't know if it'll be visible to you when you're screen sharing, but I'm happy to read off responses yeah. if you want to pose a sure. question. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. What are some responses? Do you want to reframe the question one more time? So let's say you have a relative who's a decent fat, who's a decent white male presents with painless neck mass, painless swallowing weight loss, um, you know, coughing up a blood. Well, what would most people do in this case? Um, I, I just want to pull the audience to see what, what most people would do. Dr. Ye, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Uh, so you may have to repeat your question because this is a little muffled, like you're under a pillow. Oh my goodness. Oh, was it like that previously with the rest of the talk? It was on and off, on and off. It got better when we were about to say oh, something goodness. and then it got <laughs> Oh goodness, okay. Um, you know what? It's okay, I'll, I'll make it easier. 
I did get a couple of responses. Um, some people said I got a response that says surgery, radiation, drug therapy. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else said ignore it, depending on how long the problem persists. Exactly. Yeah. So. So yeah, you know that's what happens quite often is that this is very often misdiagnosed. I think most primary care doctors they see it, they ask the patient, "Do you smoke? Do you drink?" They say, "No, I don't do any of that." So you think, you know what? This is nothing. Just ignore it. So that's why quite commonly these are diagnosed in later stages. The interesting thing about the cancers that are from HPV versus not HPV, we see that the ones that are from smoking and drinking. The main tumor in the tonsil is usually very large, right? And I think it's that local smoking, that, that effect that's kind of damaging the cells. So you have very big local tumors. They don't go to the neck lymph nodes as large. Whereas the tumors that are from the HPV infection, they usually present with a smaller main tumor, but they can cause these big lymph nodes in the neck. So yeah, commonly it, it is misdiagnosed because, um, you know, you know our primary doctors think is nothing. So that usually what will happen is the patient is referred to an ear, nose, and throat specialist. They scope the nose, they look inside, look for any other tumors, they take biopsies of any suspicious areas, and then the pathologist look under the microscope, they run special tests, you know, to see what the cancer is. And they can actually stain uh, for a protein P16 to see if it's actually from uh, the HPV virus. So this is a PET CT image. Basically, what a PET scan is, it's it's radioactive sugar that's given um, to the patient. And anywhere that's cancer, it takes up the sugar at a much quicker rate, and it gives off uh, the signal. So here, you see right here, this is the main tumor right here. It's, it's a small kind of a uh, pixel, whereas the lymph nodes in the right neck, this is all lighting up. This is malignant. So it tells you where the cancer is and helps us delineate where it is. You know, interestingly, cancers from HPV, the survival is much better than HPV negative cancers. So this is from the CDC website. This is time in months, you know, zero all the way up to 60 months, uh, five years. And you see the HPV positive patients um, where the tumor is HPV positive, the survival is very high, over 80%, right, even long term. Whereas the ones that are HPV negative, these are ones from smoking and drinking. Uh, these usually have much worse problems, as you see that. These are more important to control. So this is, you know, a linear accelerator. These are the radiation machines we use. So radiation nowadays is very, very sophisticated. 30 years ago, when patients get radiation, they were set up based off what we call clinical setup, where we see the patient kind of say, hey, the tumor's here and here, let's put a beam here and here, and maybe one here and here. So we weren't really able to do radiation well because we didn't really know where we were going. So with modern radiation, basically, what we can do is we can do a CT scan. We can actually map out the body, right? So this is the body from the side. You see the eyes right here. This is the brain. This is the back of the skull. So the tumors right here, which is red, this is where we drop the highest dose of radiation. Right? So you see the, this little thing with the light a map. It tells you, um, you know, the dose. So the red is the highest, blue is the coolest. So when you look at this map and you see it's reflected here, right? So we drop the highest dose where the tumor is. These surrounding areas are considered kind of high, you know, higher risk areas, so we don't treat them to full dose, but we treat it to you know um, a lower dose of sterilized area. And this blue is kind of just you know, some one-off radiation dose. Uh, but with this type of sophisticated planning, you can really target the tumor and avoid things like the eyes, the brain, you know, other parts of the body that don't need radiation. But with this CT scan, I can actually calculate exactly how much dose of radiation is in the eyes. The tongue, we have set standards, right? We know the eye can get this much dose. We know the brain can get this much dose. So we do our plan to make sure we are under these constraints to make sure the patients are safe. So that's what can help us you know, make patients safe. This is kind of personalization that we do, um, you know, with the with the CT scan. So usually for these advanced cancers, we're treating them with 
chemotherapy and radiation. Radiation is usually daily. It's Monday through Friday. The treatments are pretty quick. They're only 10 to 15 minutes. Um, it's like a tan. I tell patients if you tan 20 minutes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you have a nice even tan. But if you tan 100 minutes on one day, you can burn yourself. So treating this area, there's a lot of sensitive structures in the brain, there's the spinal cord. Um, so definitely we want to go slow, right? We also add on chemotherapy. So chemotherapy and radiation are different. Radiation is high-powered extras that direct treatment to certain areas of the body. As chemo is, is, a, is a liquid usually we're built, it's given through the veins, so it affects the whole body and we call it systemic. The point of giving chemotherapy with the radiation is it helps it helps the radiation you know be a lot more effective and about 10 to 15 percent more effective. Um, just that way we give patients patients the highest chance for cure. You know, if it's, it's early stage, you know, we can get away with radiation alone. But, you know, if it's more advanced, you know, kind of travel to the lymph nodes, and we want to have a chemotherapy to help kind of give us an extra edge to making sure the patient's cured. But usually with these HPV infections, we see very, very good local control and accuracy over 90, 95 percent. So these are generally very good. The chemotherapy is usually given uh, every three weeks. Uh, you know, but, but some patients opt to have it weekly also. And it's kind of the same concept when they give it every three weeks, they give it a much higher dose. Patients are usually a little bit more sick with the once every three week dose. Um, whereas patients with weekly chemotherapy, usually they tolerate a lot better because you're getting a you know, lower dose weekly. So this is a PET scan, you know, before and after. Right? You see here, this is the main tumor right here, and the whole campus is lining up very bright. Uh, you see lymph nodes on both sides lining up. You know, we found that tumors are more close to the midline, like let's say a tonsil tumor is really just localized to the right side. This is less chance of it spreading to the opposite side. But once you start finding about tongue lesions, you know, uh, you know, palate lesions, lesions in the midline, there's more chance of it going up to the right. Uh, so we see here, there's just involvement of both sides of the and this is three months after treatment. You see all the areas have quieted down now. It's a repeat PET scan. Uh, usually we do it three months afterwards because even once chemo and radiation finishes, the effects are still working for you. About three months treatment on the tumor. So if we get these PET scans too early, uh, sometimes everything's lining up. It's not a true reflection of what's going on. So we're going to wait three months for the inflammation to calm down and get a better idea of what's going on. And we still have patients it's scoped I mean, every two months the first year, every four months, six months afterwards. That's because sometimes if there's a small lesion, these PET scans can still miss it. So it's always good to kind of do a scope to go in and verify that uh, you know the tumor is there and there's no recurrence of the Okay, any, any questions from uh, my talk? So every I have a question. Sorry. Uh, Sorry, Rachel, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say people are welcome to unmute themselves or type it into the chat, and I'm happy to read it out. So you can go ahead and start, Tara. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so I am 58, going to be 59, um, going through.